Hey, what's your number? Oh, you know, the number of journals you've started and abandoned. What did you think I meant? You may have heard by now that journaling is not just a way to record your life, but a way to help you think better. You might see all those pictures on Instagram of people with their beautiful artistic bullet journals or, you know, writing entry upon entry and think, wow, there's someone with self-discipline. But I have some great news for you. Self-discipline is a lie. Instead, it's all about making journaling more enjoyable and into something that actually works for you. I was once in your shoes, oh aspiring journaler, uh, but I've now been journaling for about 10 years and I thought I would share a couple tips, things I've learned on how to make journaling work for your life and be something that's actually useful. So let's get into it. If you want to commit to a journal, my first tip is to give up what you think a journal is supposed to be. Instead, focus on what you want out of it. So in an earlier video, I shared the three kinds of journaling, or at least the way that I see it. I break down journaling into three different types. There's recording, processing, and planning. And each of these has their own benefits. So recording is all about recording events that happen to you, recording your thoughts about them. And the two main benefits are one, having something that you can look back on one day and say, well, that was my life. Uh, it's also a great way to kind of notice life passing you by, almost as a meditative, reflective activity. Processing is any sort of journaling that you do to work through your thoughts and emotions, and it's great if you often feel overwhelmed or unsure about what you think of a given topic. And planning is about organizing your life, setting habits, uh, making sure things don't slip through the cracks. So before anything else, just take a second and listen to your gut. What kind of journaling do you think you need right now? What are the benefits that you want in your life right now? For example, you might be struggling to create a recording practice of doing your little daily diary entries when really you need to spend more time doing processing. And that's something that would actually be more useful to you. So rather than getting down on yourself for not being able to keep a consistent journaling practice, take some time to analyze what you actually need. Is it recording, processing, planning, or a mix of the three? And then you can begin exploring different ways to meet those goals. Which ties into my second tip, make it as simple as possible. What is the easiest form of journaling that would give you the benefits that you're looking for? So for example, for recording, do you need to do a full entry every day, uh, maybe with pictures, or do you just need to write three bullet points at the end of each week? For processing, you know, you want to work through your thoughts and emotions. Is that something that you need to do every day or just when you feel the need to? Like it doesn't necessarily need to be a daily habit. And do you need a physical journal or would a Word doc work just as well? And for planning, do you need a full daily journal planner where you're writing down all of your to-dos and your habits and tracking everything and time blocking all in one space? Or would just a simple to-do list work? Now, I don't know the answers to these questions. That is entirely based on you, but it is valuable to slow down and, and ask them. Um, I do think that we get really caught up in what we think journaling is supposed to look like, what we see other people doing, whether online or our friends. It doesn't have to look like anything. It's just a question of what's gonna be most valuable to you and your life right now. But let's say you do want to make journaling some kind of habit. In that scenario, I would direct you to tip number three, which is tie journaling to an existing stimulus. So what do I mean by that? I mean tying the uh, desire to journal to a habit that already exists in your life. And this comes from the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. And he writes, You often decide what to do next based on what you have just finished doing. Going to the bathroom leads to washing and drying your hands, which reminds you that you need to put the dirty towels in the laundry, so you add laundry detergent to the shopping list, and so on. No behavior happens in isolation. Each action becomes a cue that triggers the next behavior. When it comes to building new habits, you can use the connectedness of behavior to your advantage. One of the best ways to build a new habit is to identify a current habit you already do each day and then stack your new behavior on top. So a really obvious one is, let's say you drink coffee every day and you want to start a habit of checking your planner. You could easily say, okay, mentally, every time I sit down at my desk with my first cup of coffee, I am going to open my planner or whatever planner system you have. Or let's say you want to set a recording habit where you are writing down things that happen each day. You might decide, okay, every day after I brush my teeth, I'm going to open my phone and write three bullet points of three things that I want to remember that I did today or learned today. But what's great about a stimulus is that it's not necessarily time-based. 
It could just be tied to uh, certain events or emotions. So for me, I set a stimulus of every time I feel overwhelmed and I feel like I need to go run to someone to start spouting my emotions, I'm gonna take a second and open my journal and journal about it first. So for me, journaling for processing is tied to the stimulus of feeling overwhelmed. But basically, setting up those little if thens in your head is what can help you set a habit. So if you feel a certain way, then you're going to do this action. Or if you go through this action on a daily basis, then you're going to journal about it. Now, all of that is wonderful, you know, setting habits, figuring out what kind of journaling you wanna do, but it's not gonna be useful for you unless you follow tip number four. And that is don't censor yourself. This especially applies to journaling for processing. And I think a lot of us are trepidatious for many reasons about sharing our true thoughts in a journal. And I just kind of want to run through all of those and address them one by one. So first for the perfectionists among us, you might be concerned about filling up a journal with the wrong things <laughs> that you're going to waste space by filling it with senseless, nonsensical drivel. And I feel you there, but we gotta let that go because your journal ultimately needs to be a sandbox. Um, I think that it is so important to create a safe, judgment-free zone where any thoughts can come out and, and just exist within that journal. Uh, that's really where processing happens. That's how you're able to begin to work through those thoughts. You know, but then the next question would be, well, what if those thoughts that come out are scary for whatever reason? You know, you might be in the process of journaling and stop and think like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm about to write this, or I can't write that, or, you know, I can't even think it. Now, I'm not a therapist or a psychologist, so please don't think of me in that way, uh, but I personally think that thoughts are only dangerous when they are unprocessed. When a thought comes up and you're like, oh, that's really scary, and so you tamp it back down, that thought is going to continue living in you and it's going to fester, and even when you're not thinking about it, it is going to influence the way that you live your life because you haven't dealt with it. I think that it is much healthier to let those thoughts exist, write them down, think about them, and, and without judging it, stop and think, okay, where does this come from? What is the thought behind the thought or the beliefs behind this thought? Because a thought in itself is not harmful. It's just your brain firing randomly. And so where does that thought come from? And then you can make a logical, rational decision about what you want to do with that thought. That's just the way that I think about it. Um, and I will say that if you find that your thoughts are too intense for just journaling and you're not sure what to do with them, let that be a sign that it's time to consider getting a therapist if that's something that is possible for you. If you can, seek out someone who can give you guidance on how to process those thoughts as well as teach you how to process them on your own in a way that is safe and healthy. Now, another reason why many people are trepidatious. Now, no, mm, need more coffee. Give me the words to say. Now, another reason why you might feel the need to censor yourself in your journaling is the fear of someone else reading your journal. That's totally valid. Uh, but to which I just say, take some preventative measures. So uh, two scenarios here. First, if you trust the people that you live with, then just make sure they know. Like set some explicit rules and expectations. So my husband knows that my journal is a private processing place. Um, I trust that he's not gonna just pick it up and start reading it. And likewise, he trusts that I'm gonna share things with him because we don't keep things from each other. He also has marching orders of like, if I'm no longer here to watch over those journals of what should be done with them, because that was a bit of a concern for me too. And if it's for you, then, then set those expectations with someone. Now, if you don't trust the people that you live with, you have a couple options. You could, for example, uh, find a protected space online where you can journal somewhere that other people can't access. You could also journal on paper that you could safely throw away, you know, whether that's throwing it away at school or somewhere else away from home. Because here's the thing, journaling for the purpose of processing it's about the process. It's about working through your thoughts and emotions. And keeping that can be can be very nice. I personally like to keep it, but it is not strictly necessary. And you can absolutely throw it away at the end. Like it's about the process of working through your thoughts, not about creating something that is some sort of work of art that you need to hold on to. But let's say that if you are keeping a journal in the long term, tip number five is to make it easy to reference. Regardless of the kind of journaling that you're doing, it is going to be more valuable to you if when you look back on what you've written, 
you have a general idea of what you were thinking about and the time period of it. So at a minimum, put a date at the top of each entry. Uh, something else I like to do though is to add a underline under the general topic. So for example, if I'm doing a processing session on my career, I'll literally just write on career and underline it and then write everything else below it that I'm thinking about. This creates a simple, slightly messy system that allows you to go back and easily find, you know, if you're thinking, when was I thinking about that thing? You can go back and say, oh, oh, there it is. And it's easy to see as you're thumbing through your journal. Another way to make your journal more easy to reference is to keep it in one place in your house. Like, like I know this is just, you know, general organization, but it's really helpful. The last thing you want, you know, when you are feeling overwhelmed and want to process or you're looking for your daily planner, the last thing you want is to be tearing your house apart, trying to find where on earth you put your journal last. So try to keep it designated spot for it, this will make it far more useful. Now my last tip is another way to get more value out of your journal, and that is to make it a creative practice. So we've already covered the general ways of getting benefits out of your journaling, right? The, the recording, processing, and planning, but there are lots of ways that you can layer in more value so that it becomes a, a practice that is more enjoyable and something that you look forward to. Like let's say you are a writer or you want to develop your writing skills, instead of just keeping a journal as a, a, as a basic record of things, you might actually turn it into a writing practice of every day or every week you are highlighting certain events, you're using colorful language, like, 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 like nice language, not just like expletives. So it could be that too. <laughs> You're writing with artistic flair to capture certain events and emotions. If you like visual art, you might incorporate photos you've taken or, or even paintings right there in the journal. Um, and as I've said before, scrapbooking can absolutely be a valid form of journaling. Overall, journaling has to be something that fits you and your lifestyle and your desires in order for it to be something that you want to commit to long-term. Because if journaling isn't actually enjoyable in the moment, then you're not gonna wanna do it. So let journaling be light let it be something that you can explore freely and make your own. So we'll go ahead and wrap with that. Uh, let me know down in the comments if you have any other tips that you would share with other journalers. And I do still want to know your number. <laughs> How many journals have been false starts? No shame. Let me know. I think mine is five. Mine is the ones that I threw away as a kid. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope that this has been valuable to you in some way and uh, I'll catch you in the next video. Take care. Hey, what's your number? Hey, you know, the number of journals you've started and abandoned. Hey, hey. <laughs>